that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the critical part of this. Faith cannot exist by itself. If it is not accompanied by action, earlier in this passage, James says it's worthless. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing uh, sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, last week we talked about the whole partiality bit. But have you heard these words before? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. What do we commonly call that? The golden rule. James calls it the royal law. We typically think of the golden rule being a, a New Testament concept, something that Jesus taught. Well, he did teach it, but when he taught it, he was quoting Leviticus. Look at Leviticus, Le, Le, Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you should love your neighbor as yourself. There it is in the writings of Moses. So this was not a new concept. But I'm intrigued by what James calls it. He called it uh, the lawyer, royal law. Why do you think he did that? Ron? Jesus was on we, got a micro we got a microphone. Thank you, Linda. Jesus taught it and he is on the throne now. That's, that's what I think. I think you're right. Because this royal law was one that was given by King Jesus. Uh, let me read this. N.T. Wright is an Anglican scholar and theologian, and I love his writings. And he wrote this. This is the royal law by which James presumably means the law which King Jesus himself endorsed and insists upon. This passage, incidentally, is one of several which make it clear that the early church really did see Jesus as King and Messiah. They believe that God has established uh, his kingdom in and through Jesus, and they were determined to lo live under the rule whether or not the rest of the world and the rest of the Jewish people whose Messiah was, whose Messiah Jesus was, took any notice. And, and it kind of harkens back to, to what Peter said on Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made him both what? Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. When we say Lord Jesus Christ, we're doing more than just saying a name. Lord was his designation as ruler. Jesus means Savior. Christ means Messiah. So we're proclaiming who he was. I think Paul had a comment. Well, I, I think, too, when I think of the names of Jesus, it was love. One of them is love. Mm -hmm. and, and in this mention there, why it could be called a royal law is because it, this is on the subject of love. Okay. Good. Good, good. Yeah. Now. Let's move on. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And here we are entering into a topic, a subject that has been discussed and debated 
practically since the day it was written. Um, a faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We're going to look at this from several different ways. I, lo I love this passage. Uh, the next. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Blackwell's paraphrase. You tell me what you believe without doing anything about it. And I will show you my faith by the very things that I do. Let me give you a practical example. I believe this chair will support my weight. I believe it with all my heart. Do you believe I believe it? Some of you are nodding. I can be very convincing that way. How can I actually demonstrate my faith? Sit down on the chair. Ta-da! This chair will support my faith. Now, if I had just talked about it and not done anything about it, what good would that be? I'd still be standing up. Let's talk about it some more. I love this. So what are works? We're talking, I mean, anybody ever read this passage in James before? <laughs> so what are works? We need a microphone there, please. John? Somebody set John's alarm, please. <laughs> I just said feeding the hungry, uh, uh, clothing the needy. Uh, those are just a couple. Well, yeah, because look at what he said at the end of chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this, mm -hmm. to, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. It's interesting how much, of James, how much James talks about, even in this passage, taking care of the poor. Mm-hmm. Kind of similar to something his big brother said a lot, right? Okay, Richard's got a comment. Put on, lace up your new balance there. But I would say that works can be any physical action, anything that we do. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, there are physical things that we do as part of the acts of becoming a Christian. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's, that's something that we do that could be considered a work. We are baptized for the remission of our sins. That could be considered a work. And many do. We don't have time to go into a full discussion of that right now uh, because I don't think baptism is a work. I think baptism is a response. But God, that, that's where the controversy of this, exactly. of this passage comes in. Exactly. So. Uh, that's where the controversy of the whole is baptism uh, essential or not. Uh, many of our friends who believe in what is called the faith only position uh, say that if we believe that baptism is essential for salvation, then it has become a work and our salvation becomes work based. Let's look at what the ISBE says. The ISBE is a uh, classic reference book, the International standard Bible encyclopedia works is used by Paul and James in a special sense as denoting with Paul those legal performances by means of which men sought to be accepted of God in contradistinction there's a good twenty dollar word for you contradistinction uh, to that faith in Christ through which the sinner is justified apart from all legal works and he's got, they've got several passages up there. So James says, faith without works is dead, right? Go like this. Everybody nod. Listen to Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Uh, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus 
for good works which God prepared beforehand. Paul says we're saved by grace apart from works. Not by works lest any man should boast. James says faith without works is dead. Which one's right? Both. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Uh, my good friend J.J. Turner uh, has written a book uh, called uh, The Book of James. J.J. was the preacher at the church where my dad was an elder for many, many years, and he's taught on Christian colleges and, and preacher schools and things like this. And the way he described it is that Paul is talking about the root. James is talking about the fruit. I like that. What Paul is talking about is that if I rely on physical actions, as, especially as it relates to law-keeping, circumcision, dietary restrictions, observing feast days, if I rely on that as my salvation, it's not going to work. Because that puts aside the whole reason one of the reasons the law was given was to show that we can't be saved by keeping a set of do's and don'ts and I'm afraid modern Christianity has replaced one set of commandments with another you know with us if you attend church you give you be a good person you check all the boxes make sure you take the Lord's Supper every Sunday I'm not putting down any of those things. Those are things that we do, but not in order to obtain salvation. You see, I'm not called to worship. I worship because I've been called. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> hear it again. I'm not called to worship. I worship because I have been called. So Paul is talking about those acts of the law. And you remember uh, when Peter came uh, to the Galatians and he was doing fine, you know, with, with Gentile Christians and all that. But then those who came, from, Paul writes about this in the book of Galatians, uh, second or third chapter, when those who came from James, Peter quit eating with the, with the Gentiles. And Paul called him a hypocrite. Finally, James and Paul got aligned uh, about Acts 15 in the, in the Jerusalem conference. But James is not talking about those kinds of works. He's not talking about the ISBE kind of works. What James is talking about are the things that I do because I believe. It is when my faith grows legs and gets busy. Ron? Well, you stole most of my thunder, but I was, <laughs> I was thinking of uh, this being a transition period in which the Jewish people had certain things that they had to do, mm -hmm. and you had to get away from the concept of doing it because you got to, to right. doing it because you want to. Right. And that's a demonstration of love and, and the works that you do. How many of you had a mama like I did when I would say, oh, we got to go to church? What would she say? <laughs> Nancy, you must be related to my mama. You get to go to church. And that's right. You know? You know why I like coming here on Sunday morning? Besides getting to see all you wonderful people, listening to some usually pretty good sermons. Usually. My Jesus is here. My Jesus is here. For when two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there I am. And if he, in the Texas Standard Version, right smack in the middle of you. My Jesus is here. Why would I want to be anywhere else? In 1859, you know this guy? In 1859, there was a world-famous tightrope walker named Charles Blondin. He even, he even worked with uh, P.T. Barnum some. 
But he was the most famous tightrope walker in the world. Now, there are several versions of the story that I'm going to tell, but I'm going to tell the way I heard it first and the way I like it best. In 1859, it was in June, Blondin stretched a tightrope across Niagara Falls, 1,100 feet, I think, and decided he was going to walk across it. Crowds gathered. People, he, he publicized, he was... He was a, a tremendous self-promoter. And whenever he would do something, people would come from miles around. He's going to walk on a tightrope across the, Grand, uh, the, the Niagara Falls. And so as he stood there and he did some warm-ups and things like that, uh, he turned to the crowd and said, How many of you believe that Blondin can walk this tightrope across Niagara Falls and back? And there were a few people that kind of raised their head, but most people were going, mm, never been done before, and it's pretty, uh, pretty treacherous. So Blondin got up on the tightrope, walked across, and walked back. He said, now how many of you believe that Blondin can walk across Niagara Falls? And everybody raised their hand. He said, now, how many of you believe that Blondin can walk across Niagara Falls on this tightrope blindfolded? And he was starting to get a few more believers, so a few more people raised their hands. So he said, watch. Put a blindfold on, walked across, walked back. Got off, said, now how many of you believe Blondin can walk across the tightrope, the Niagara Falls, blindfolded? Everybody raised their hands. He said, now, pulled a tarp back, and there was a wheelbarrow. He said, how many of you believe that Blondin can walk across this tightrope across Niagara Falls, blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow. Well, again, he's starting to get more and more believers, so more people raise their hands. And he pointed at one of them and said, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> and he ultimately did push someone across. You see, that's what James is talking about. Faith is when we get in the wheelbarrow. Faith is not just being hearers of the word, it's being doers. Faith is getting in the wheelbarrow. Um, and there he is with the wheelbarrow. Uh, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is worthless? Faith apart from works is what? And this is the English Standard Version, worthless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Look at that phrase. Faith was completed by his works. That's what the things that I do on behalf of the Lord does. It completes my faith. It finishes it. I have a son-in-law who is reputed to be a great project starter. Starter. Uh, my daughter gets very frustrated because there are all these started projects that don't get finished. Richard? Behind you. Uh, a couple of things. I uh, backing up just a little bit to your to your comments about uh, about worship. I, I think I agree with with you know with the comment that we worship because we're called. But I I think it's important to recognize that we are commanded to worship. So whether you want to say that we're called to worship or we're commanded or what have you, you know we worship because we're told to do so, as well as because of the fact that we that we are saved. Uh, I, I think in this whole discussion, a lot of the problem comes down to, to chronology because we, in this, in this passage, you may be going to get to it, but it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That almost sounds the opposite of what he said just above that. Right. So, and and we'll, we'll circle this yep. back around, and that's exactly what it says here. Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. James, in my mind, in, uh, by my study, is not talking about a mental agreement 
James is talking about a faith that consumes the whole being and drives him to things. Right. Abraham could not have understood why God said, take your only son and sacrifice him to me. He had waited for him. He was over 100. Sarah had, was over 90 when the boy was born. I love what, uh, the insight that Hebrews gives, the Hebrews writer gives us into Abra's, Abraham's thinking. Because when talking about this incident, it says that Hebrew ju or Abraham just supposed that God would raise him from the dead. But, but that, that, from a chronological standpoint, if we think about it in human terms of when was Abraham justified, mm -hmm. it was the moment that he believed. But, but when you recognize that, that God is not bounded by the constraints of time, God had the, the foreknowledge to know that Abraham's faith was going to lead him to do whatever he was told to do. And True. that's, the, that's the, the result of the faith. And the, the passage here, if you're an accountant, Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him. It was attributed to him. It was um, reckoned. There's that old good old word. Reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the critical part of this. Faith cannot exist by itself. If it is not accompanied by action, earlier in this passage, James says it's worthless. I want to thank my young friend, Nora Baker. Uh, I saw her drawing a couple of weeks ago uh, here at the building, and I asked her to draw me a picture of a rowboat. And it's, it's, you can't see it. It's very small. But there are two oars here. On this oar right here, it says works. On this oar right here, it says faith. What happens if you get in a rowboat and you just use one oar? Jerry says very accurately, you're just going to go around in a circle. So if I've just got my faith oar cranking, I'm going to go around one way if I've got my works or cranking I'm going to go around the other way if I want to get where I'm going I've got to use them both I've got to engage them both uh, thank you Nora Baker and you can you can let her know I called her out and credited her okay you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. As some translations add being alone. Okay, check my clock. Um, we've, we've all seen these kinds of things. Some of us all too frequently you know it's a monitor for our vital signs it tells us what our heart rate is what our blood pressure is what our oxygenation you know how many of you have a pulse oximeter at home yeah you know tells you what your blood saturation level is if these vital signs are not there what happens if i stop breathing long enough it's not a tough question. What, what, Stacy? You die. What happens if my heart stops long enough? You die. Right, Doc? Okay. What I see James saying here is that the vital signs of faith are works. The way I know what my faith is, the way I know what I truly believe, the way I know that my faith is saving faith is because of the things that I do as a result of that. It's not the things that I do to get there, it's the things that I do because I'm there. Um, great example, Mark 5. How many of you are, are watching... Uh, season three of the of the chosen right now isn't it amazing daniel did you see it last sunday night 
probably the most powerful episode I've seen to date. It's, it's this story. And there was, and, and as Jesus went on his way, a certain ruler of the a Pharisee, a, a certain ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name, came up and besought him, and I'm quoting the King James because that's how I learned it, and besought him greatly saying, my little girl is sick unto death. I pray thee come and lay your hands on her that she may be well. And he went with him. And great multitudes followed him, thronging him. Have you ever been thronged? You know, I've been in some throngs. Uh, when, when we lived in South Florida, one of the things we really liked to do was volunteer for professional golf tournaments, for PGA tournaments. We, we worked the Honda Classic. Uh, we worked the Dan Marino tournament, which was uh, on the Celebrity Tour. And we worked the tournament at Doral for a number of years. And one year, my assignment was to walk inside the ropes, was to go and pick up this one professional golfer at the driving range, escort him to the first tee, and then walk inside the ropes with him for nine holes. Uh, guy's name was Tiger something. And this was in his, at the peak of his career. There was this one place between the, the uh, driving range and the first tee where there was a pathway made by ropes about as wide as this aisle. They were thronging it. It was walking with Tiger. I was here, he was there. I was just off of his right shoulder that I understood what thronging looked like. People were yelling at him, screaming at him, reaching to touch him, holding things out for him to sign. And I thought, okay, now I get it. People wanted to be with Jesus. People wanted to touch Jesus. People wanted to talk to Jesus. Oh, if it were that way today. So, as they went on their way, the multitudes followed him, thronging him. Now, there was in the crowd a woman who had had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things at the hands of many physicians and didn't grow better but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, she said in herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be well. And making her way through the crowd, she reached out and touched him. Now let me tell you how I see that. It's not, the, it's not that she could say, excuse me please, I'd like to go and touch Jesus. And the crowds parted. <laughs> no. I see her having to turn sideways. I see her maybe even elbowing away. Maybe she even had to get on her knees and crawl some. And I see her maybe three or four people back reaching as far as she could reach. And with the last ounce of strength that she had, her fingertips grazing his clothing. And the Bible says, and immediately she knew in herself that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus feeling that virtue had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? And his disciples said, Lord, <laughs> look at the crowd. And you're asking who touched me? And Jesus searched to find her who had done this thing. And she came weeping and kneeling at his feet and told him the whole story. And he said to her, daughter, this is the only time I can think of where Jesus called a woman daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. And as they turned to go, certain from the ruler of the synagogue's house came and said, your daughter has died. Why trouble the, ma uh, the master any longer? And Jesus looked at Jairus and said, fear not. Believe. And when they got to the, to the ruler of the synagogue's house, there was a great commotion with weeping and wailing. Uh, and, and he asked, what means this commotion? The little girl is not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. 
And putting all of them out of the house except the child's parents and Peter and James and John, he went into where the little girl was lying. The Bible doesn't say this. I see him smiling. I see this little, he, he looked down at this beautiful little Jewish girl, 12 years old, hair probably lovingly brushed by her mother for what she thought was the last time. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is, little girl, I say unto you, arise. And she arose and walked, for she was 12 years old. And Jesus charged them straightly not to tell anyone, but to give her something to eat. Look at that. He just raised her from the dead, and she knew she'd been sick. He knew she'd been sick. He knew she was probably hungry. Give her something to eat. In my mind, I see Peter looking at James, James looking at John, John looking at Peter, and both of them going, what did we just see? Now, let's go back to this woman. What did Jesus say healed her? Say it louder. How did he know? Well, besides the fact that he's Jesus and he knows everything. How did he know that woman had faith? She worked so hard by the fact that she made her way through that crowd. If she had said, you know, I really believe. This woman was incredibly outcast. She was probably one of the loneliest women in that city. She couldn't be around her family because uh, of her condition. She couldn't go to synagogue. She couldn't be in the marketplace. She was lonely. She was desperate. And if she would have stayed back in that corner, huddled in the corner, and said, you know, I really believe if I touch him, I get well, but didn't do anything about it, she would have died with that disease. It was not until her faith grew legs and she reached out. That's the way it is with us. If we sit on our pews and sing, oh, how I love Jesus, until the cows come home, but we don't do anything about it, James says our faith is worthless. My good friend Dale Foster put this on his Facebook page the other day. Faith without works is a force. I mean, faith with works is a force. Faith, faith without works is a farce. How many of you believe that I believe that if you wear brown corduroy breeches to teach a Sunday school class in Lutz, Florida, you're going to hell. How many of you think I believe that? Why? I've got a pair of brown corduroy britches teaching a Sunday school class in Lutz, Florida. Emerson wrote, What you are, shout so loudly in my ear that I cannot hear what you say to the contrary. Let that one soak in. So in the end of them, in the end, it's not a matter of faith or works. It's a matter of faith that works. You want saving faith? You want the faith that pleases God? You want the, the faith that healed that woman who had been sick for 12 years? You want the faith that raised Jairus' daughter from the dead? We didn't even talk about the amount of faith it took for him to go get Jesus. You want the kind of, of faith that Jesus said the Roman centurion had that he had not seen anywhere? When the centurion came and asked him to heal his servant, Jesus started to go with him. He said, no, I'm a man of authority. I tell this one go and he goes. I tell this one come and he comes. Just say the word and he'll be healed. When the centurion got to his household, he found that the servant had been healed from the very moment Jesus said, that he would be. That's the kind of faith the Lord is calling us to have. That's the kind of faith that this world needs. We all have seen people 
whose lives are a denial of their faith, right? You know, <laughs> Lance, you'll like this. It's a police story. The police officer pulls this lady over. And he, he has his hand on his weapon. He said, ma'am, would you step out of the car, please? He said, I need to see your license and registration. And she gave him, and she had to, she said, I'm going to go into my glove box. And we, we still call that a glove box, don't we? He said, I have to reach into my glove box and, and get my papers. And so he did, and he said, hmm, okay. I was, I was sure this was a stolen car. And she said, why? And he said, well, I was, I've been driving behind you for a while, and I saw you had the fish sign, uh, the Christian emblem in, in your back window. And I saw you had that bumper sticker that says, what would Jesus do? And I saw you, you, another bumper sticker that says, um, I'm a member of such and such a church. But at that red light back there, when that woman almost ran into you, you cussed her like a sailor. And then when another person got in your way, you gave them the finger. I figure this had to be a stolen car because someone whose faith is displayed like that couldn't be acting that way. How many times at Kroger, well, we don't have Kroger here. How many times at Publix or at Walmart or at Target or at Chewy's Do we tell the, the world we do not believe in Jesus Christ by the way we treat people? By the way we treat each other? By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love each other. Doesn't matter what the sign says out front. Kent? This, this is where it all comes about. How we treat people. And Neil's, not, Neil's left and he's not even going to believe this. But we're 20 minutes early. We need questions, comments. I was just going to repeat because he wanted the people online to hear. Okay. But uh, I'm going to be trying to follow this fantastic lesson uh, next week. And um, you know, we're going to be talking about using our tongue. Uh, next week, uh, there you go. Look at there. So uh, I just wanted to say th a shout out to uh, starting next week off right. It's almost like it's in the same book. <laughs> you know? We uh, that quote that I gave from Emerson the first time I heard it was on Paul Harvey's radio. Y'all remember Paul Harvey? I think there are enough people in this room that, and at noon. He would always have the rest of the story. I love that guy. He was, he was great. He tells about back in the, the 60s, late 60s. Some of you were around then. I was. Um, you remember there were all kinds of movements. That's when protesting and everything became very much in vogue. It was protesting the Vietnam War. And, of course, we went through the whole civil rights uh, protests and there was also uh, the Jesus movement started then, and there was that wonderful group called the ecology movement. Ecology was what we call green now, you know. Save the water, save the earth, save the air. Well, there was, uh, Harvey tells the story that there was a rally in upstate New York, not far from Woodstock, and thousands of, of, of people came to protest the pollution of the air, the pollution of the water, the pollution of the, of the ground. And they met there for two or three days and they rallied and they rallied and they yelled and they protested and they held up their signs and banners. And when they left, they left five tons of litter on the field. And that's when Paul Harvey said, Emerson said, what you are, shout so loudly in my ear, then I cannot hear what you say to the contrary. The story is told of Alexander the Great. A young man conquered the known world by the time he was 30. 
very powerful leader, very powerful general. On one occasion, the story goes, uh, a young man was brought in front of him, accused of cowardice. Which was not tolerated in the Greek army. Especially not the Greek army of Alexander the Great. And he looked at him and he said, young man, what is your name? And the boy brightened. He said, my name is Alexander. And the general looked at him and said, change your life or change your name. Call yourself a Christian. Let your work show it. Questions, comments, criticisms. Over here, John. Just an observation. Uh, cool. You talked about the lady that maybe had a stolen car. I don't know what it is about the American automobile, but us Christians, we profess to be a Christian. We get behind the wheel of a vehicle, fasten the seatbelt, start the, the car, and we, we've completely changed. A car becomes a heathenator, doesn't it? it it's, <laughs> it's an, I, I guess this is a, a, a suggestion. Is each one of us, and I'm talking about myself, we need to examine ourselves before we start that car and before we fasten that seatbelt. What, what kind of show are we going to put on? And some of us, it's terrible the way we drive and the way we treat other people. You're right. Absolutely right. Okay, in 28 minutes, we're going to be in this room together. We're going to sing. We're going to be led in prayer. We're going to hear a, a pretty interesting sermon, I know, because I've already seen the notes. Will we worship? I'll confess to you, there are a lot of times when I've been in this room and rooms like it and never got anywhere close to worship because my mind was on other things. I was, I'm going to have to really discipline myself to keep from wondering how badly my cowboys are going to beat the Buccaneers tonight. Tomorrow night. Did I say that out loud? Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about it in Matthew 23. What produces the works that we are called to do? Created for good works, the Ephesian passage said. Is here. It's with the heart. The Pharisees were amazing people. But they gave obedience instead of giving their hearts. Obedience is important, but we quoted the passage last week, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Let's focus, let's put away the things of this world, let's give our hearts truly to God as we worship Him.